director of the campus ministry here in the Detroit region. And yes, round of applause for that. I'm just so excited um, for us to be able to be here to serve the Lord and to uh, uh, be in fellowship with you guys. I'm going to read a verse here from Psalms 23, and we'll go from there. It says, Psalms 23, verses 1 through 4, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So if this is your first time or your hundredth time, that's the Lord we serve here. That's the, 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 the joy that we get, the rest that we get. And as you come, I hope you just feel loved as we will uh, continue worship. I'll pray for us first. Dear God, just so grateful for this time, grateful that we get to hear an awesome lesson from Tom Wilson, and we get to worship you and be in fellowship with your people. God, just uh, let us be refreshed in this time, even though it's rainy, it's all kinds of things. Let us be focused on you and your love. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Y'all love the fellowship? And we're going to sing what a fellowship.
up to Calvary. Did he crucify my Lord? Amen. 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 See the empty tomb now.
the sisters will lead and the brothers will follow. Chris Phillips, and uh, this is the time in our service where we talk about communion. Uh, so just some backstory, I'll say. Within the past few months, my wife and I have been looking for a house. And uh, if you know the housing market at all, it's been very stressful. And then on top of that, I've been working on call for the past three weekends. So even during softball games, I had to secretly work in the background. And then um, my work laptop's actually in the back. I'm going to call today. But... Uh, I've taken on some uh, personal projects that have taken up a bunch of my time as well. My school summer semester has started, so I've been feeling like super overwhelmed. And I'm not really a get overwhelmed kind of guy. So when I was feeling overwhelmed, I was like, all right, you feel this way, but like, keep it pushing, keep it moving. And obviously that doesn't work. It hasn't, it hasn't helped out at all. So I've just been like stuck in this like overwhelming like just feeling. But then, you know, I think of Jesus and how he felt. Um, he was just overwhelmed like leading up, leading up to the cross. So I want to look at Matthew 26 and verses 36 through 39. Uh, it reads, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken uh, taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. You know, Jesus didn't try to rationalize his feelings away or ignore his responsibilities. You know, he felt the weight of uh, just the sin and guilt that he was taking on for our behalf. And he was overwhelmed, but, he, you know, he turned to his friends and he ultimately turned to God and he said, you know what, I'm going to do this because I love each and every, I love mankind. So he did this on our behalf. Uh, so with that in mind, let us pray. Uh, Lord in heaven, so thankful to come before you this morning. Um, just thankful for your son's sacrifice, Lord, just uh, denying himself, taking on the sins of all of humanity. Um, even though not everyone loves him, not everyone acknowledged him, Lord, he still did it because he loves us so much. I pray in this time we can just remember his sacrifice for us as we take the, uh, the juice and the cup, or in the cracker. Lord, I love you, and I pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. that we have, including our giving. But I came across this one in Psalm 112. 
uh, that, that just helped me uh, get a, a different perspective on uh, the type of person who's, who's giving and generous. Psalm 112 starts with, Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. Their generation, the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in the darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. I'm going to let the, the, the scripture speak for itself, but we see how there, it's, it's so intertwined. Those who are righteous and who are generous and live with, with justice. So, you know, with that, just uh, t- we'll take a moment to, to think on that as we pray, and then uh, we'll have some announcements. God, we, we thank you for giving to us so generously. You, you've, you've loved us so much, and you give us uh, the path to life. God, and I pray that as we're on that path to life, we'll see how it's intertwined with just being uh, generous people who, who lend and give freely uh, to those in need. And, and God, I pray that, uh, that we will see these promises come true in our own lives, in the lives of our children, and, and in all that we touch, God. Uh, we love you so much. And just say I pray. Amen. All right, so I, I'm not leaving the stage. You're wondering why. Uh, I am doing announcements today. Uh, while well, well, John is uh, away. So uh, we'll get into that. At first, actually, we have a video from Hope that we'll watch right now. So yeah, as we know, there's so many needs in this world, and, and Hope is doing some great work. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Uh, and, and you can even start. <laughs> you can even start by giving uh, right here in the community as, as we're trying to spread uh, the good news of Jesus. Uh, there's the black box in the back. Uh, you can give your uh, your offering in the black box or anytime online at DetroitChurch.org. Um, speaking of our finances, uh, Financial Peace University and, and uh, those members in our church who are running that program are offering, again, uh, the course. Uh, the summer class starts on July 15th, and registration and the classes is all free. And so see Ben Dunn for more information uh, or email dcocfpu uh, at gmail.com. I uh, also want to remind you of a lot of different events that we've got going on. Uh, you can always check the website for more of our events and, and things like this. Uh, the Women's Retreat is coming up in September. Uh, to register, you can go to DetroitChurch.org slash events. Uh, have a, a couple other announcements. Uh, Rex, uh, you know, we know Rex Smith, he, he had a surgery. He's, he's home. He's doing well and recovering. Thank you all for the prayers and continue praying for his recovery. Uh, also, one more prayer request. Uh, Pat Clanton's sister is in the hospital, and so please be praying for her and, and for the family. Um, Mark Kang has an announcement about softball. All right. Last week was the conclusion of our softball league, and if you're visiting for the first time, there are three things that are fundamental to the identity of the Detroit church. One, that we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. One, we believe that a, a true Christian is someone that has devoted themselves as a disciple of Christ. And thirdly, that sports is a great way to bond and to fellowship. <laughs> three core beliefs. Anyways, um, excited to say that uh, this year our finalists, uh, the final two teams, you know, they, we have six teams and then the four make the playoffs. And the last two teams were the uh, Purple Cobras and the Ferocious Flamingos. Yes, very exciting, very exciting. <laughs> And excited to say that the champions this year were the Ferocious Flamingos. We're going to have the captain of the Ferocious Flamingos, Nathaniel Schlosser, come on up. Uh, so, uh, and Nathaniel, if you could stay here. You know, Nathaniel is our first rookie head coach to win the championship since... His father, Kevin Schlosser, won the championship. That's right, seven years ago. So the Schlosser family has really dominated our league with like a dictatorial reign. And so we're happy to have uh, Nathaniel here. For, we have a, an MVP trophy every year given, uh, voted on by the coaches as the most valuable player. And in the past eight years, there are three Schlossers on here. Exactly. And uh, this year, uh, we had uh, several great uh, uh, nominees, and the winner this year is our campus brother, Tyler Lockney. Tyler, why don't you come on up? <laughs> and uh, last but not least, we have the most inspiring player, which is the top female award given to sister that displays sportsmanship, excellence, and of course, just overall good-heartedness. Again, many nominees, and this year, the voting landed on Carrington Cobb. And Carrington, come on up. All right, these are this year's winners. We're all... Let's take a brief fellowship break. We'll be back in three minutes. Let's uh, have a brief fellowship break.
singing, Lord God Almighty. everybody sounded good sounded better than the weather looks outside and uh and you look better than the uh the weather looks outside as well we uh we got down in uh, the detroit area thursday and uh then after today we're going to shoot out to ann arbor and be with their service and then we head back but uh i know i've told you this so many times but it's such a great joy for Lori and me to be back in the state of michigan and, uh, amen, I, I guess you guys are okay with it, you haven't run us into Ohio or some nasty state like that. If you're from Ohio, I really apologize, but I probably ought to stop there. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, as many of you know, Lori and I spent uh, a little over six years of our lives right here in Detroit leading the church. We were so grateful to be able to hand that off to Mark and Ruth, and then we went back to Milwaukee, but Mark and Ruth are some of our dearest friends, and uh, Mark is like the ultimate optimist. You know that, don't you? Uh, Because uh, the first time I met Mark, you may not know this, he comes up to me and grabs my arm, grabs my shoulder, and he says, "I I know I could take you. 
<laughs> and so this went on for a period of time, and then finally we had a little wrestling match in our backyard in Milwaukee. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. You can ask Mark uh, how badly he whooped up on me and uh, all that kind of stuff. It didn't go quite like that, did it, Mark? Yeah. Uh, I want to. I tried to find a creepy picture to get your attention to start out with, and there it is. But uh, I, I, the the title of the message today is "Remember," and let me read this passage in uh, Ephesians chapter two, one that you've read in the past. Hopefully, you've read all the passages in the past. That means you're studying your Bibles on a regular basis. Amen. If you ever come across one, oh man, I've never read that. Hopefully you're a younger Christian uh, and not an old Christian that should have been several laps through your Bibles by now. Amen? Remember that at that time, you who were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. This is a common theme, Old Testament and New Testament, this word remember, or I want to remind you. You could argue that the entire Bible is just one big reminder of who God is, His power, His glory, His might, His mercy, his sternness, and all the other qualities that he possesses. But in this case, Paul is writing to a group of Christians who are probably 10 to 12 years old in the faith now. They were doing well in the city of Ephesus. The church was thriving. It was growing. It had become kind of a a missionary center, if you will. And so there were no real issues going on at that time, some peripheral ones perhaps. But Paul, as he does in many of his letters and many places throughout the scriptures, this word remember pops up. And he's taking these people who had walked with the Lord now for 10 years plus and wanting them to remember where they were when this whole thing started. That they were separate, that they were excluded, that they had no share, no inheritance. In fact, they were actually enemies of God. And that can be said for every one of us in this room. If you were a Christian a day, or you've been a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years, this is the same thing that we have to remember as well. Because when we go back and have this reminder of our conversion, when we first started to walk with the Lord, I don't think God wants so much for us to remember, oh, was it sunny? Was it cloudy? What was the water like? Was the water cold? What kind of clothes did I wear? I think he wants us to remember the condition of our heart as we entered into this commitment to follow the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I remember my heart. This goes back 41 years now, 42 years. I still remember the studies that led up to it. I remember the grace and the faith that was instilled upon us as people that were just studying the Bible. I also remember the scriptures that revealed the sin that we had lived in but were totally unaware of is a case a lot of times, isn't it? It's not until we read the Bible that we even know what some of those descriptions of sin actually are. But then I, I also remember Lori's heart, my heart melting, being unbelievably grateful that God has given us a chance to be forgiven and to walk with Him. And I always remember that sunny afternoon in Tampa, Florida, when we walked out of the Sunrise Church, Church of Christ building and we walked down to the outdoor baptism, I remember the grates being pulled off. I remember the brother with the scoop, the, uh, the pool scoop, the skimmer, you know. He cleared off the leaves that had blown in there. That was nice of him. 
I still would have done it, even if it was dirty water. Uh, and, I, I, and I remember the words. I remember being nervous. I remember having Lori go first, and then I went after her. And I remember hugging my wife after we were baptized and walking home together, or walking back to the car together to go home, and this unbelievable feeling of being cleansed and having a purpose. Every person in this room that's a follower of Jesus Christ has an experience like that. And God wants us to remember always the heart that we had in the very beginning. That's why this reminder, reminder, remember, I want to call to your attention. All these passages start coming into play so that we can always remember. Amen? Amen. Give you a little color on this one. Uh, As with all of us, we don't always know what's going on in our heart. Even right now, we may not even know what's going on inside. But God always knows what's going on inside. And God's job is to reveal to us what's going on inside of our heart so that we can have that come to the surface and then either be encouraged by what those things are or be convicted by what those things are. But God does this not to shame us, not to punish us, not to look down upon us, but rather to save us. Because as he reveals these things, they bubble to the surface and then we have an opportunity to do something about that. The initial time that our hearts are revealed is in Acts chapter 2. You know the passage. We won't turn to this one this morning. But it's where God had set the time and the place for everything to come to a head. They're in Jerusalem. It's the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit makes an appearance. People start doing some things that are hard to understand. And then Peter gets up and he explains for the very first time in all of history, the simple plan of salvation. This Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. Then when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? The plan that was conveyed that day was not complicated. It's actually very rudimentary, very simple. He said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as we read the rest of that unveiling of the heart, 3,000 or more responded to the message that very day. Every one of us, that's had that experience in our lives, we now have a reference point of the purest time that our hearts were revealed and we got them right before the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now I'm thankful, as many of you are, that you didn't see everything that the Lord saw right at that moment. Because we might have been so overwhelmed that we just walked away thinking there is absolutely no hope for us. Just a couple weeks ago, Joe was baptized. And uh, we felt uh, super excited about that. Obviously, Cordell so sad about his loss. But here's a guy that had fought God a lot of his life. A good guy. I, I remember talking with Joe on a number of occasions. But had fought God for a number of years. And then finally, when it was revealed to him that his life was not going to last much longer, he started to think about spiritual things. And Cordell and uh, Alicia and others can tell you the, the details in more detail. Cliff can. But then, when he saw the sin that was in his life, as Cliff conveyed to me, he felt like, how could God ever forgive me? I've ignored him all this time, and now I get to be a part of this as well. And uh, he started to wrap his head around that, embrace that thought. 
The first will be last and the last will be first, as Jesus said. And he was baptized. He snuck in under the wire. Amen. But he's chilling or resting wherever that place is right now. Uh, And uh, he made it before all of us. We still have to endure life on this earth. And he escaped all that stuff, you know. Doesn't seem right. Well, it is. It's great. It's awesome. Okay, a little bitterness just came out. A little little jealousy. That was the first time, if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. This is the one that I think really applies to most of us. We've read this passage in Hebrews chapter 4 pretty much with anybody that wants to study the Bible to learn about becoming a Christian. We do a study about the Word of God with them. And this one always makes it in the lineup. But I want to remind you, you get the connection there? Uh, I want to remind you that this passage was not about helping people become Christians. This passage was addressed to people who had walked with Jesus now for perhaps as long as 60 years. And... Up in the, uh, up in the uh, earlier part of this chapter, it says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. But then in verse 12, it says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. The Word continues to reveal what's inside of our heart. And that's why it's so important for every one of us, regardless of how new or how old as a Christian you are, to constantly be in the Word. Every day doesn't have to be this monumental, epic study of the Bible, but we have to have a steady diet, a steady inflow of Scripture into our lives. Otherwise, our hearts can get hard just as these people's hearts became hard. We start living a Christian life, but it's really a secular life. We're not appreciably different from those outside of Christ We've done a good job of fitting in with the rest of the world. Oh, but we go to church on Sunday. This does not change our heart. Even this message today, which I hope will impact you by the time I'm done with it, but it's really up to you to do something with the words that you hear, as it always has been. From that first sermon in Acts chapter 2 to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount to all the other lessons and scriptures that have been given to us. It's up to us to do something with that. And it's all so that we can have our hearts continually revealed and not miss out on the life that God has for us. Amen? Inside every one of us, there's what I would call a fatal flaw. There's something there that we may not know about or we do know about and we've suppressed it, or we know about it and we've ignored it, but it's there within us. And that flaw can actually circumvent the power of God's grace if we're unwilling to deal with whatever lies within our heart. I've been pretty active all my life. Uh, My weight's gone up, down a little bit kind of almost petite right now. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, but, uh, you know, this, this happened on March 8th. I was bringing the trash can up from the bottom of our driveway. We live up on a hill a little bit. And by the time I got to the top of the hill, I was totally out of breath. And I thought, man, am I that out of shape? Because I'd been walking uh, three and a half miles a day, thereabouts, and stuff like that, feeling pretty good. And so I blew it off like every real man would do. You ignore that stuff. 
<laughs> and then the next day, I was down in the basement, and I came back up, just one flight of stairs, and by the time I was at the top of the stairs, I was totally out of breath again. But this time, I'm feeling a little shaky and a little lightheaded, and I thought something was wrong. Lori was concerned, but not overly concerned, because uh, I've shared this with you before, but I've had so many of my friends die over the last number of years. I- I'm a little bit of a hypochondri- hypochondriac, or whatever that thing is. Uh, you know, I-, I-, I feel like maybe I've cheated death, and why did my friends go before me? Uh, you-, you know, all that kind of stuff. So she said, I'm- I-, I told her, I'm going to go to the ER in a moment of humility. I decided this. And so I went to the ER, and, uh, or the urgent care, right around the, the block from where we live. They did a bunch of tests. Everything was fine. I was still feeling weird. They said, you know, if you want to explore this more, you should go down to the ER and check yourself in and let them run some tests that we can't do here. In another moment of humility, I decided... I I was headed home, and then I got back on the highway and went down to the ER. Long story short, after some tests, they found that I had this little blockage up here, and I never knew anything about it. It was 90% blocked. Uh, Hadn't had a heart attack. There were no pains, no complications from any of this, but... When I let these doctors look into my heart on a deeper level, they found the blockage, and then I've got this little tiny scar right here on my wrist. They fished a wire through that that little spot all the way into here, put a stint in that's no bigger than uh, the length of a finger, and everything's fine. I haven't had any problems at all. But had that process not followed that way, I wouldn't be preaching here today. You'd have to listen to Lori preach, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, and so, you know, I've been a preacher for a long time, and it's hard not to use a, some radical story to work into a sermon, and so you're the recipients of this for the very first time. Uh, there is a spiritual application to this because in all of us there lies or potentially could lie something that would prevent us from actually making it to heaven. God's grace is enormous and immense. He gives us opportunity after opportunity. But if we ever start stop looking at our hearts and stop dealing with sin that's in our lives then we can go down a road that is going to lead us in a direction that we're going to be very disappointed with on the day of judgment. And so we have this passage in Mark chapter 7. Verse 20, Jesus says, He went on, what comes out of a man is not what makes him unclean, For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these come from inside and make a man unclean. This is what we dealt with when we remember our baptism. Many of us were totally embroiled in many of these behaviors that Jesus talks about right here. But then when the Word was revealed to us, we saw the consequences of sin, and that Jesus had the only cure, we decided to walk away from these things and get them out of our lives. As everybody that's ever become a Christian since Acts 2 to the present day, had to do and will always have to do, no matter how long this world continues. But it's these things that settle in our heart, 
These are the things that destroy us spiritually and the things that God wants us to see before they do irreparable harm to our souls. Amen? And then we have this opportunity to repent. God searches our hearts all the time. He doesn't have to look very far because He's God, right? He knows right now what you're thinking, what you're thinking, what you're thinking. He knows what's in your heart, in your heart. And if I pointed at you, I'm not trying to say anything personally about you. It's just an illustration, all right? Don't, you can come up to me afterwards if I hurt your feelings by pointing to you, but you're awesome, you're awesome, you're awesome. You're awesome. Okay. So I made up for that, all right? You feel better now. How does he do that? Well, he's God. I don't know. I have no answer for that. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all-everything. He would have every one of those trophies that were passed out had he played softball this year. But he knows what's in there right now. As you sit here this day in July 2023, He knows what's in your heart right now. Now that can be a scary thought or it can be an encouraging thought, but it also will be an enlightening thought if we continually ask God, hey God, what's in my heart right now? Is there something here right now that displeases you? Is there something in me that's causing all this drama and chaos around me. You know, a lot of times we can blame other people for all of our relationship issues, but if you've got a string of them out there, they all point back to one source. You. Can they all be that jacked up and against you? Maybe, just maybe. I think it's worth worth asking yourself the question, though, is there something in my heart that's affecting how I interact with my brothers and sisters, my family, my friends, co-workers, classmates, etc. As Jesus went through his ministry, he had a unique way and a supernatural ability to know what was going on inside of a person's heart. And he often did it in an embarrassing way, like embarrassingly honest with people that he encountered. Some of his disciples that were squabbling about who's going to be first. He says, well, I I know what you're thinking. And whoever wants to be first is going to have to be last. You're going to have to be the slave of all. The rich young ruler comes to him in Mark chapter 10. Seemingly a great guy. His life is all together. Knowledgeable, spiritually minded. Jesus says, one thing you lack, go sell everything, give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. He identified this portion of this man's heart as being greed. And isn't it interesting that that same word is used in this passage in Mark chapter 7. These are one of the evil things that get stored up in our hearts. He has a talk with a Samaritan woman at the well, John chapter 4. There's a little interesting conversation. She says, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, it's true, you don't, but you've had five husbands and the man you're sleeping with now is not your husband. Embarrassingly honest. But she responded with humility and became a follower of Jesus later on. Amen? I think for many of us that are older Christians, we're in a time in our life where maybe we've grown tired of wanting to know what's really going on inside of our heart. And so we shut it down, we put a little crust around it so nothing can penetrate, we stop reading challenging passages. We don't really pray about our hearts much anymore. 
We avoid people that we know will ask us spiritual questions. And I hang around my friends in the church that I have common interests with, sports, activities, uh, TV programs, etc. And so by doing that, we can still be in church, but not really thinking about our hearts. We've figured out a na- way to navigate through the fellowship so we don't get convicted, we're not asked questions, we're not engaged in other people's lives, and we just go through life. I just want to say, I don't think that's a healthy way to live as a Christian. We have to always be asking what's going on inside of our heart. This thing with greed that Jesus mentions, I think is kind of plaguing many of our churches. This is not directed toward the Detroit Church of Christ. I know some things just because uh, Lori and I are shepherding the Michigan churches. Uh, but this isn't exclusive to the Detroit church, don't, so don't think that I'm picking on you. Mark didn't ask me to say this. But I've noticed in many of the churches, not only in the U.S., but some that Lori and I are involved with around the world, it's the older Christians, instead of engaging more, they engage less. This should not be. Instead of giving more and sacrificing more, time, money, whatever, they hold back because they felt like, I did all of that, I'm tired of doing that, it's easier if I don't do that. And so now we have a lot of churches of various sizes that are really struggling to grow and mature and develop to be able to meet the financial needs of the church And a lot of this is traced back to greed that lies within our hearts. Lori and I uh, are, we have government jobs. We live on Social Security right now and and get a a stipend from uh, the MMA and a little bit from the Detroit church, which we are super grateful for. And uh, so our income has changed dramatically from what it was a year ago. And so there's this, we've even wrestled with this personally, like, do we give more, do we give less? Special contribution was last week in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it was tempting to pull back from that, but we talked about it, we prayed about it, we just felt like for our hearts, we got to give everything that we were going to give when we had a different type of salary. We can't do that forever, but we could this year, And so it was good for our hearts to push ourselves to sacrifice and things of that nature. Uh, Yeah, that... Amen, but that's not worthy of applause. That's, That's just what a Christian should do. As I've talked with other ministers about the makeup of their congregation, and this is one of the areas that we'll talk about from time to time, And let's put it in perspective. One, God doesn't need a penny or a half a penny from anybody in this room for his will to be accomplished. But if you're going to have a church, the church needs money. (laughs) You know, it's just, you've got to have a place to meet, you've got to have some ministry staff, you've got to pay some bills, you've got to have, nowadays, you've got to be online and do all this stuff, you know. Back in the old days, you could stand up on a beach, open up your Bible, and just let it rip, you know, and preach the word, and nothing fancy. We've got to have flyers now, and I mean, it is kind of what has to happen nowadays, but all of this takes a, a fair amount of income for a church, especially the size of Detroit, to move forward. There's a lot of people in the Detroit church that I know personally that have been blessed in amazing ways financially, and every one of them that I know and everyone that I know in all the other churches that we're familiar with, these people are extremely generous, sacrificial, and they give. And they should. So it's not, it's commendable, but it's not ultra commendable, because God even 
when Jesus was down there on the earth and he sat where the collections were being taken, people were putting in tons of stuff and along came that poor widow that just had a couple copper coins and he said she gave more than all the others. So good-hearted people generally say, oh man, I heard this and got my heart and now I need to give more. I'm not asking that. I think if you're not giving or you're giving like every other year, every other quarter, there's something that can be traced back to your heart that's affecting that. It's not the amount that you put in the plate. It is, what is the root of all of that? Is it a blockage? Resentment, bitterness, you're mad at the church. Well, if it is, let's just be honest about it and deal with those things. Get it out. If it's something else, you've overextended yourself. You're trying to live in, uh, uh, at, at a lifestyle that your, your income cannot afford. Well, then let's be honest. Let's get it out in the open. Let's deal with it. We could have this same conversation about any of the other things listed there, but I just wanted to mention that one. We won't spend a lot of time here, but our hearts are pretty amazing, you know, because they can, they can withdure a lot, like I had this damage, but it didn't cause any long-term damage, and now I'm fully recovered from it. I got to watch the amount of fried pork chops that I eat now, and <laughs> probably, probably, Lori, I can't have any more, just so you know, and, uh, and we, we go over to the Alexander's last night, and Sean had this unbelievable dinner prepared. It was uh, 17 hours of smoked pork butt. And uh, I mean, I I was drooling just thinking about eating it. But then as I ate about it, or or ate a little bit of it, I was very restrained. Didn't you think I was restrained, Sean? Yeah, uh, I, I just can't live on a diet of that stuff. I have even no idea where I am in the sermon right now, but uh, that got me distracted. Oh, I, I know, our hearts are resilient. Uh, they can be hard and soft. You could have a really hard heart about some type of sin, but have an amazing heart about generosity and serving and other things. You cannot play the game that a lot of people that don't know the Bible play. Well, I, I have more good qualities than bad qualities, so I know that I'm okay. No, it doesn't work that way. Just let's acknowledge the good, but let's also acknowledge, hey, at times there's some stuff in my heart that is absolutely hard. In uh, 2 Samuel, go ahead and turn there. If you read your Bible, you'll know where to find it. 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, most of us know 11 and 12 as David's sin with Bathsheba. And that's a great title for it because it talks about that. But if that's all you take away from chapter 11 and 12, I think you're missing a great lesson that God wants to reveal to each and every one of us. And it's all about what lies within our hearts, that they can be hard and they can be soft. Remember, David is the one that God referred to as a man after his own heart. And David was amazing. The Psalms that he wrote, the life that he lived, things that he stood for, his devotion and honor to God, all of these things far outweigh the bad that was in his life. But unfortunately, here we have an example of someone that was so righteous, so good, so devoted to God, that God had a special bond with, we see him at an unbelievably low point in his spiritual life. In chapter 11, we really read about, this whole chapter is about how hard David's heart had gotten. He was supposed to be off at war, he stayed back. And then in chapter 2 through chapter 5, he's up on the roof late at night, and he sees a woman bathing. He's filled with lust, 
temptation, and eventually it leads to adultery with consequences because Bathsheba becomes pregnant. Think about even potentially the abuse of power. Here he is, the king, and now he's preying upon somebody else's wife. Part one of the cover-up starts in verse 6, where he has in his mind, I know how I can get out of this pregnancy thing. I'll get her husband to come back from the battle and set him up so that he can sleep with her, and then everybody will think that it's his child, not mine. He's a righteous man. He doesn't do it because all of his friends are still fighting. He doesn't take the respite that, uh, that he could have had. And then David tries to get him drunk the next time. So maybe in his drunken stupor, he'll go back, sleep with his wife, and now I'm off the hook again. But neither one of those work. And now David's heart takes an unbelievable spiritual plummet and the long and the short of the rest of chapter 11 is he sets Bathsheba's wife Uriah up to be murdered on the battlefield it appeared that he was killed in battle but he was actually set up, as Nathan talks about in chapter 12, he was set up to be murdered in battle, all part of the cover-up. It could have been easily told by David and others. Yeah, he was back in for a little bit, but then he went back to the front line, and I guess while he was back in town, he slept with his wife, she's pregnant now, and uh, you know that could have been covered up because Uriah couldn't have refuted that do you see how even a good heart can go bad if we stop dealing with the things that lie within in chapter 12 nathan tells him this story about a rich man and a poor man we'll just pick it up in verse 4 now a traveler came to the rich man but the rich man refrained Uh, from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for him and uh, 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 to, to the one who had come. David burned with anger against the man uh, and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then the D time of all D times. <laughs> then Nathan replied to David, you, you are that man. Wow. Come on, he saw it in the story. He saw it in everybody else. But he couldn't see it in his own life. And this is reality for all of us, self-included. There's things that other people may see in our lives that we are oblivious to. That's why we cannot unplug from deep, meaningful Christian relationships. We can't unplug from reading our Bible. We can't unplug from asking God to show us what's on the inside. Otherwise, we'll become just like this, being critical of everybody else, but never having the ability to look within and ask ourselves what's going on inside of here. Luke chapter 6, we'll close with this verse.
Let's start in verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick fig trees from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Now listen carefully. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, his mouth speaks. If this were being written today, that last sentence might be, for out of the overflow of his heart, the mouth speaks and the fingers type. This passage, there's an element of encouragement in that. There's an element of fear in that. And then there's an element of wonder in all of this. Because what, as we should ask ourselves, what am I storing up in here? What's it getting filled up with? This is the weird thing about God. Wouldn't wouldn't you in some ways just like Him to shield us from every temptation, every evil under the sun? And that we would just be like unbelievable super magnets that would attract the Word of God, Christian thoughts, godly thoughts, and things like that. And we had no chance of ever storing up anything else. Well, it's not the way it works. We still have free will. We have choices that we can make, every one of us in this room. Now, the encouraging part of it is, I have the ability, so the Word says, to store up in my heart what is pleasing to God. And there is this warning that if I'm not careful, I could also store up things that are displeasing to God. I mentioned the finger typing thing because I think this is one of the plagues of Christianity in this day and age. There is so much information coming at us at light speed, so many different things, so much time spent doing this or doing that and not enough, let's just put that down for a little while. I have never been tempted by whether or not anybody has ever liked or disliked anything I've posted because I've never posted a thing. (laughs) They might be talking about me right now, but I'm oblivious to all that. I'm free. I'm I'm clear. I'm lighthearted. I don't don't really care. But why do we play the world's game? There is good that comes from all of that internet stuff. I use it. Lori uses it, but let's just face it. If we're not careful, this is just simply a conduit so that you can store up evil within your heart. Bitterness, anger, rage, lust, impurity. And the list goes on and on. Hatred, discord. And so we're told by Jesus again, There is this thing that happens. The good man stores up good that comes from his heart and the evil man, the evil that's stored up in his. I know this church pretty well. Not only have we led it in the past for six years, we've developed a lot of great friendships. It's always a joy for Lori and I to be here for a little time or a long time. And I know there's tons just tons of great hearted people. But I know even the great hearted people still struggle with things that come up in their heart. I've got some stuff that I've got to really watch my anger right now because of a situation where my mom's being taken advantage of. Lori and I are trying to intervene, but I'm really struggling to be compassionate towards those that are making her life a little miserable. This, this is something I'm dealing with right now, this anger, resentment, and stuff like that. I would just ask for all of us to take some time this afternoon 
tonight. Ask God. God, show me what's in here. I, I, I don't want to be like some of these horror stories in the Bible. I don't want to start out strong and finish weak. I want to serve you till the day that, that I die. And I believe you will respond to that challenge, and I believe you'll do that. And I believe as we all do this collectively and individually, the Detroit church, the Michigan churches, the global kingdom of God will be better off because of it. Amen? Amen. That's all I've got. Check. All right. Isn't it? Whoa, my ninja skill stopped me from falling. Uh, grateful to have Tom and Lori here as shepherds out in the Michigan churches for all that they do to support. Let's have a prayer and then we will be dismissed. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much for a chance to worship you. Thank you for every person that's come here today. Thank you, Father, for your word that speaks to our hearts. And as we hear about our brother who uh, had a blockage in his heart, I know that you're far more concerned about uh, our spiritual conditions, uh, the things that block our hearts. God, we, uh, we're sinners. We, we battle sin every single day. And I pray that through your word, through the fellowship, and through our decision to, to walk closely with you, that you would reveal our hearts in a way that allows us to change and to draw closer to you. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the scriptures. We thank you for Jesus. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Church, you're all dismissed. Parents, please pick up your children.